In this video we'll take a look at two pieces of vintage Heathkit test equipment, the IG5280 RF oscillator and IB5281 RLC bridge. I'll discuss the history and features of these instruments and we'll look at the front panel controls and inside circuitry. I'll cover the restoration of these units and say something about the circuit designs they used. We'll see a demonstration of the instruments in operation and then wrap things up with a summary. Heathkit was a manufacturer of electronics in kit form. Their product line included amateur radio, test equipment, and various consumer products. By building a piece of electronics, you could save money and gain the satisfaction of having assembled it yourself. The 5200 series of test instruments was introduced starting in 1977 and included five models, the IG5280 RF oscillator, IB5281 RLC bridge, IG5282 audio oscillator, IT5283 signal tracer, and IM5284 multimeter. They were marketed as a value priced line of equipment for hobbyists and sold for under $50 each. Part of the concept was that the instruments provided most of what was needed for basic electronics testing and repair. You could assemble your bench of test equipment one unit at a time. The cost was kept low by keeping features to a minimum, using common components such as the plastic case, using single-sided printed circuit boards, and running on batteries. They had limited functions, lacking knobs for some controls, and no feet or pilot lights. The optional power supply, the IPA5280-1, could power up to five instruments at once and typically sold for $34.95 US. The instruments generally sold for $49.95 US, although my 1983 Canadian Heathkit catalog listed them at $104.95 Canadian, which was quite an increase over the US price at a time when the Canadian dollar was only about 20% lower than the US. Some critics now look back on this series as the beginning of the end for Heathkit as they were being squeezed on price and began to compromise on quality and features. To be fair, the instruments did provide the basic features and were a good value for the price. Most of the units were powered by two 9-volt batteries or the optional power supply. The cases could be stacked to fit on a test bench and featured a built-in handle and storage area. They were also in the shade of blue that was used for most Heathkit test equipment of this era. The series began to be discontinued starting in 1989 and the last models were offered in 1991. The IG5280 is a radio frequency signal generator. It can produce RF output from 310 kilohertz to 110 megahertz in five bands, as well as 100 to 220 megahertz on harmonics. This covers the frequency used by long wave, short wave, AM and FM radio receivers. The open circuit output level is approximately 100 millivolts RMS. There's an audio frequency output at approximately 1000 hertz with a level of 2 volts RMS. The RF output can be modulated by the 1 kHz audio with an adjustable modulation level. Both AF and RF output levels are adjustable using uncalibrated controls. The design is solid state using 7 transistors. The RF output section has a power switch, amplitude control, and banana type output jacks. A range switch selects one of five frequency ranges. The vernier tuning dial selects frequency. Common IF frequencies of 455 kHz and 10.7 MHz are marked on the dial as well as harmonics of the highest frequency band. The AF output has a separate power switch, amplitude control, and banana plug output jacks. It's fixed at a frequency of about 1 kHz. When the AF output is on, it modulates the RF output with the modulation level set by the AF amplitude control. The rear panel has a jack for external power and a switch to select line or battery power. If you did not opt for the external power supply, you could install a blank faceplate here and not wire up the power connector and switch. 
The case has a built-in carrying handle and an area for storage of accessories such as test leads. Taking a look inside, most circuitry is on one printed circuit board. It used a pre-assembled and aligned band switch and coil assembly. Inside are places for the two 9-volt batteries as well as two spares. It even has a place inside to snap the battery clips when they're unused so they do not short to anything. The test leads provided were banana jacks and alligator clips. Alignment of the unit requires adjusting a couple of trimmer pots to some values that need to be measured with a DC and AC voltmeter. Frequency calibration is done with a radio or a frequency counter if available. The assembly manual is up to the usual high standards of Heathkit and includes some basic instructions on radio alignment and signal injection troubleshooting. There are a number of large fold-out pictorials. Here we're looking at the RF output on an oscilloscope with the output set to about 2 MHz. We can adjust the output level with the amplitude control. and the frequency with the tuning dial. Now we're looking at the audio output, nominally 1 kilohertz. The meter here is reading 995 hertz. The frequency is fixed, but we can adjust the amplitude with the amplitude control. And finally, we're looking at the RF output modulated by the audio frequency output. We can adjust the percentage of modulation from zero up to 100 percent and even beyond that. Next we look at the IB5281. The IB5281 RLC bridge can measure the resistance, inductance, and capacitance of components. Resistance can be measured from 10 ohms to 10 mega ohms in three ranges, capacitance from 10 picofarad to 10 microfarad in three ranges, and inductance from 10 microhenry to 10 henrys, again in three ranges. Depending on the range, it uses a test oscillator frequency of 1, 10, or 100 kilohertz. It can also measure values against an external standard component over a 10 to 1 range from the reference value. The front panel features a power switch, level control, and jacks for the impedance to be measured, ZX, and for a standard or reference impedance, ZS. A small meter indicates a bridge null reading, and the dial is adjusted for a null value. The dial has a scale ranging from 10 to 1,000, indicating values on the internal ranges, as well as dial B, which is used to calculate the value based on a standard component's impedance. In this case, formulas on the dial show how to calculate R, L, or C based on the position when using ZS. The rear panel has the same power jack and power source selector as the IG5280. Most circuitry is on a single-sided printed circuit board with point-to-point -point wiring to the front panel and rotary switch. The rotary switch contains the reference resistors, capacitors, and inductors. There's a small metal shield on the PCB. The two 9-volt batteries are stored in the same way as the IG5280. The circuit uses 10 transistors. Calibration consists of bias and feedback adjustments to three trim pots which requires a DC and AC voltmeter. The dial position is adjusted to be correct for a supplied 100 ohm resistor, which is just a standard 5% resistor, not a precision one. Test leads were banana jacks with alligator clips. The manual covers theory of operation and some test applications. Whether measuring R, L, or C, the basic procedure is the same. Connect the component under test to the ZX jacks, select a suitable range, and turn the unit on. Adjust level for close to full scale on the meter, 
and then adjust the dial for a null or minimum value. Increase the level to get a large meter reading and then adjust again for the best null. The component value can then be read off the dial using the appropriate units and multiplier for the range selected. To compare to a standard value, use the ZS range and connect the standard to the ZS jacks. Adjust for a null and note the dial reading. You can then calculate the ZX value based on the reading on dial B, known value of ZS, and the appropriate formula on the dial. Let's measure the value of a resistor. In this case, a resistance substitution box set for 100 ohms. So we set the range to R times 1 and turn on power. We set the level for near full scale on the meter and then adjust the dial for a null. And increase level again and again adjust for the best null. And we now read off the reading on the meter which is very close to 100. So in the R times 1 range that's 100 ohms. Now let's measure capacitance. I'm now using a capacitance substitution box set for a value of 0 0.022 microfarad. So we pick a suitable range, C times 0 0.0001 microfarad. And adjust for a null. Now we increase the level so we can get a more accurate null. And the reading is very close to 220 on the C times 0 0.0001 microfarad range, which would correspond to 0 0.022 microfarad. Finally, I'm going to measure an inductor, in this case a 22 microhenry axial inductor. So we pick a suitable range, L times 1 microhenry, and adjust for a null. Again, increasing the level as we get close to the null. And I read a value of somewhere around uh, 22 or 23 microhenries. As there are only three ranges for each type of measurement, and the ranges do not have much overlap, some component values can be hard to measure accurately at the edges of the scale. For comparison, here is the Heathkit IB1B, a much older RLC bridge that offered more features. Also for comparison is this modern digital LC meter from almost all digital electronics, which directly reads and displays values on an LCD display. Both of these units were bought from the same seller on eBay in March of 2015. The units were very clean, in excellent condition, and do not appear to have been heavily used. The quality of the assembly and soldering is very good, and no modifications or repairs are apparent. They were wired to support the external power supply. Inside one of the manuals was a set of pictorials from the power supply manual, so the original owner must have owned the supply as well. Both came with original manuals which are dated 1977. They did not come with any test leads. On the RLC bridge, the rotary switch was almost seized up, but a little oil quickly loosened it. Other than that, both units worked fine. I did a little cleaning and went through the alignment procedures. On the plus side, these units, like all models in the 5200 series, were low cost, offered the basic test instrument functions, could be used for portable operation powered from batteries or from a power supply which could power up to five instruments. The main drawbacks were support of only basic features and the need for batteries or an optional power supply. They were not as attractive looking as some other Heathkit equipment. A minor annoyance is that the lack of a pilot lamp means that it's easy to leave the unit on and drain the batteries. The five instruments in the series provided most of the equipment a hobbyist would need on their electronics test bench. You can learn more about these and other instruments in my book Classic Heathkit Electronic Test Equipment. The book covers Heathkit's test equipment products starting with a brief history of Heathkit, 
an overview of the test equipment product lines, and tips on buying and restoring vintage test equipment from sources like eBay. Separate chapters cover the major categories of component testers and substitution boxes, frequency counters, meters, oscilloscopes, power supplies, signal generators, tube testers and checkers, and miscellaneous test equipment. Each chapter includes one or more in-depth sections that look at a representative model from my Heathkit collection covering its features, operation, and notable quirks or trivia. The book is available from lulu.com and Amazon and retails for US $19.95. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, check out my other YouTube videos on vintage radio and test equipment.